The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs. Part 1. Without, the night could be cold and wet, but in a small parlor of Labernon Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess. The former, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical chances, brings his king into such sharp and unnecessary peril that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placently by the fire. Hark at the wind, said Mr. White, who, having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably desirous of preventing his son from seeing it. I'm listening, said the latter, grimly surveying the board as he stretched out a hand. Check. I should hardly think that he's come tonight, said his father, with his hand poised over the board. Mate, replied the son. That's the worst of living so far out, bawled Mr. White, with sudden and unlooked-for violence. Of all the beastly, slushy, out-the-way places to live in, this is the worst. Paths a bog, the roads a torrent. I don't know what people are thinking about. I suppose because only two houses on the road are let, they think it did, doesn't matter. Never mind, dear, said his wife soothingly. Perhaps you'll win the next one. Mr. White looked up sharply, just in time to interrupt a knowing glance between mother and son. The words died away on his lips, and he hid a guilty grin in his thin gray beard. There he is, said Herbert White as the gate banged to loudly and heavy footsteps came towards the door. The old man rose with hospitable haste and opened the door, was heard condoling with the new arrival. The new arrival also condoled with him, so that Miss White said tut tut and coughed gently as her husband entered the room, followed by a tall, burly man, beady of eye and rubicund of visage. Sergeant Major Morris, he said, introducing himself. The Sergeant Major took hands and took the proffered seat by the fire, watching contently as his host got out whiskey and tumblers and stood a small copper kettle on the fire. At the third glass, his eyes got brighter and he began to talk. The small family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of wild scenes and doughty deeds, of wars and plagues and strange peoples. Twenty-one years of it, said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. When he went away, he was slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him. He doesn't look to have taken much harm, said Miss White politely. I'd like to go to India myself, said the old man, just to look around a bit, you know. Better where you are, said the sergeant major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass and sighed softly, shook it again. I should like to see those old temples and fakirs and jugglers, said the old man. What was that you were starting, you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Morris? Nothing, said the soldier hastily. Lest ways, nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw, said Miss White, curiously. Well, it's a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps, said the sergeant major offhandedly. His three listeners leaned forward eagerly. The visitor absentmindedly put his empty glass to his lips, then set it back down again. His host filled it for him again. To look at, said the sergeant major, fumbling in his pocket. It's just an ordinary paw, dried to a mummy. He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. Miss White drew back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. And what is so special about it? inquired Mr. White, as he took it from his son, and, having inspecting it, placed it upon the table. It had a spell put on it by an old priest, said the sergeant major, a very holy man. 
He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives and that those who intervened with it do so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes of it. His manners were so impressive that his hearers were conscious that his light-hearted laughter had jarred somewhat. Well, why don't you have three, sir? said Herbert White cleverly. The soldier regarded him the way that middle age is wont to regard presumptuous youth. I have, he said quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. And did you really have the three wishes granted? asked Miss White. I did, said the sergeant major, his glass tapped against his strong teeth. And has anyone else wished? persisted the old woman. The first man had his three wishes, yes, was the reply. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the paw. His tone was so grave that a hush fell upon the group. If you've had your three wishes, it's no good to you now then, Morris, said the old man at last. What do you keep it for? The soldier shook his head. Fancy, I suppose, he said slowly. I did have some idea of selling it, but I don't think I will. It has caused me enough mischief already. Besides, people won't buy it. They think it's a fairy tale, some of them. And those who do think anything of it want to try it first and pay me afterwards. If you could have another three wishes, said the old man, eyeing him keenly. Would you have them? I don't know, said the other. I don't know. He took the paw and dangled it between his forefinger and thumb, finally throwing it into the fire. White, with a slight cry, stooped down and snatched it off. Better let it burn, said the soldier solemnly. If you don't want it, Morris, said the other, give it to me. I won't, said his friend doggedly. I threw it into the fire. If you keep it, don't blame me for what happened. Pitch it on the fire like a sensible man. The other shook his head and examined his possession closely. How do you do it? He inquired. Hold it in your right hand and wish aloud, said the sergeant major. But I'm warning you of the consequences. Sounds like the Arabian Nights, said Miss White as she rose and began to set dinner. Don't you think you might wish for, for four pairs of hands for me? Her husband drew the talisman from his pocket, and all three burst into laughter at Sergeant Major, with a look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. If you must wish, he said gruffly, wish for something sensible. Mr. White dropped it back in his pocket, and placing chairs, motioned his friend to the table. In the business of supper, the talisman was partly forgotten and afterwards the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second installation of the soldier's adventures in India. If the tale about the monkey's paw is not more truthful than those he has been telling us, said Herbert as the door closed behind their guest, just in time to catch the last train, we shan't make much of it. Did you give anything for it, father? inquired Mrs. White, regarding her husband closely. A trifle, he said colored slightly. He didn't want it, but I made him take it. He pushed me again to throw it away. Likely, said Herbert, with pretended horror. Uh, why, we're going to be rich, famous, and happy. Wish to be an emperor, father, to begin with. Then you can't be henpecked. He darted around the table, pursued by the misaligned Miss White, armed with an anti macaster Mr. White took the paw from his pocket and eyed it dubiously. I don't know what to wish for, and that's a fact, he said slowly. It seems to me that I've got all I want. If you only cleared the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you? Said Herbert, with his hand on his shoulder. Well, wish for 200 pounds then, that'll just do. His father, smiling shamefacedly as his own credibility, held up the talisman as his son, with a solemn face, somewhat marred by a wink at his mother, sat down and struck a few impressive chords. I wish for 200 pounds, said the old man distinctly. A fine crash 
from the piano greeted his words, interrupted by a shuddered cry from the old man. His wife and son ran towards him. It moved, he cried, with a glance of disgust at the object as it lay on the floor. As I wish, it twisted in my hand like a snake. Well, I don't see money, said his son as he picked it up and placed it on the table. And I bet I never shall. It must be your fancy, father, said his wife, regarding him anxiously. He shook his head. Never mind, though. There's no harm done, but it gave me a shock all the same. They sat down by the fire again while the two men finished their pipes. Outside, the wind was higher than ever as the old man started nervously at the sound of the door banging upstairs. A silent, unusual, and depressing settled on all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire to rest for the night. I expect you'll see the cash tied up in a big bag in the middle of your bed, said Herbert as he bid them good night. And something horrid squirming on top of your wardrobe watching you as you pocket your ill-gotten gains. He sat alone in the darkness, glancing at the dying fire, seeing faces in it. The last was so horrible and so simian that he glanced at it in amazement. It was so vivid that with a little unease laugh, he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hands grasped the monkey's paw, and with a little shiver, he wiped his hand on his coat and went to bed. Part 2 In the brightness of the wintry sun next morning, as it streamed over the breakfast table, he laughed at his fears. There was an air of prosaic wholesomeness about the room which had lacked on the previous night, and the dirty, shriveled little paw that was perched on the sidebar with a carelessness which betoken no great belief in its virtues. I suppose all old soldiers are the same, said Mrs. White. The idea of us listening to such nonsense, how could wishes be granted in such in these days? And if they could, how could 100 pounds hurt, father? Might drop on his head from the sky, said Herbert. Morris said the things happen so naturally, said his father, that you might, if so, you have wished so, attribute it to consequence. Well, don't break into money before I come back, said Herbert as he rose from the table. I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, adversarious man, and we shall have to disown you. His mother laughed and followed him to the door, and watched him down the road, and returning to the breakfast table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity, all of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door as the postman knocked, not preventing her from referencing somewhat shortly to the retired Sergeant Major's biblious habits when she found that the post brought a tailor's bill. Herbert will have some more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he gets comes home, she said as she sat at dinner. I dare say, said Mr. White, pouring himself some beer. But for now that, uh, the thing moved in my hand. That, I'll swear to. You thought it did, said the old lady soothingly. I said it did, replied the other. There is no thought about it. I had just, what's the matter? The wife made no response. She was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside, who, peering in, in an undecided fashion at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. The mental connection with the 200 pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well-dressed and worn a silk hat of glossy newness. Three times he paused at the gate, then walked on again. The fourth time he stood with his hand upon it, and then with a sudden resolution, flung it open and walked up the path. Miss White, at the same moment, placed her hand behind her and hurry hurriedly unfastened the strings of her apron, and put the useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. He gazed at her furtively and listened in a preoccupied fashion as the old lady apologized for the appearance of the room and her husband's coat, a garment which he usually reserved for the garden. 
She then waited as patiently as her sex would permit for him to broach his business, but he was at first strangely silent. I was asked to call, he said at last, and stooped and picked a piece of cotton from his trousers. I'm from Ma and Megan's. The old lady started. Is anything the matter? She asked hastily. Sit down and don't jump to conclusions. You're not bringing us bad news, I'm sure, sir. And eyed the other wistfully. I'm sorry, began the visitor. Is he hurt? Demanded the mother wildly. The visitor bowed in assent. Badly hurt, he said quietly. But he is not in any pain. Oh my goodness, said the old lady, clasping her hands. Thank God for that. Thank... She broke off as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned on her, and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's averted face. She caught her breath, turned to her slow-witted husband, and laid her trembling hand on his. There was a long silence. He was caught in the machinery, said the visitor at length in a low voice. Caught in the machinery, replied Mr. White in a dazed fashion. Yes. He sat staring out the window, and his wife's hand between his own pushed it as he had wont to do in their old courting days nearly forty years before. He was the only one left of us, he said, turning gently to the visitor. It is hard. The other coughed, rising, walked slowly to the window. The firm wishes to convey their sincere sympathies with you in your great loss, he said, without looking around. I beg that you will understand that I am only a servant and merely obeying orders. There was no reply. The old woman's face was white, her eyes staring, her breath inaudible. On her husband's face was such a look as his friend, the sergeant, might have carried into his first action. I was to say that Ma and Megan's disclaim all responsibility continued the other. They admit no liability at all, but in consideration of your son's service, they wish to present you with a certain sum of compensation. Mr. Weitz dropped his wife's hand, rose to his feet, glancing with a look of horror at his visitor. His dry lips shaped the words. How much? Two hundred pounds was the answer. Unconscious of his wife's shriek, the old man smiled faintly, put out his hands like a sightless man, and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. Part 3 In the new cemetery, some two miles distant, the old people buried their dead and came back to the house steeped in shadows and silence. It was all over so quickly that at first, they could hardly realize it, and remained in a state of expectation as though something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load too heavy for old hearts to bear. But the day is past, expectation gave way to resignation, the hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged a word, for now they had nothing to talk about. Their days were long to weariness. It was about a week after that, the old man, waking suddenly at night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in darkness. The sound of subdued weeping came from the window. He rose himself in bed and listened. Come back, he said tenderly. You will be cold. It is colder for my son said the old woman, and wept afresh. The sound of her sobbing died away in his ears. The bed was warm, and his eyes were heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully, and then slept until a sudden wild cry of his wife awoke him with a start. The paw! she cried, bewildered. The monkey's paw! He started up in alarm. Where? Where is it? What's the matter? She came, stumbling across the room towards him. I want it, she said quietly. You've not destroyed it? It's in the parlor, in the bracket, he replied, marveling. Why? 
She cried and laughed together, bending over and kissing his cheek. I only just thought of it, she said hysterically. Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't I think of it? Think of what? He questioned. The other two wishes, she replied rapidly. We've only had one. Was that not enough? He demanded fiercely. No, she cried triumphantly. We'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly and wish our boy alive again. The man sat in his bed and flung the bedclothes from his quaking joints. Good Lord, you are mad, he cried. Get it, she panted. Get it quickly and wish. Oh, my boy, my boy. Her husband struck a match and lit a candle. Get back to bed, he said unsteadily. You don't know what you're saying. We had the first wish granted, said the old woman feverishly. Why not the second? A coincidence, stammered the old man. Go get it and wish, cried the wife. Quivering with excitement, the old man turned and regarded her. His voice shook. He has been dead ten days, and besides, he... I would not tell you otherwise, but I could only recognize him by his clothes. If he was too horrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back, cried the old woman, and dragged him towards the door. Do you think I fear the child I have nursed? He went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlor and then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place, and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized up in him, and he caught his breath as he found that he had lost the direction of the door. His brow cold with sweat, he felt his way around the table, grasped along the wall, until he found himself in the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seems changed as he entered the room. It was white and expectant, and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish! She cried in a strong voice. It's foolish and wicked, he faltered. Wish! Repeated his wife. He raised his hand. I wish my son was alive again. The talisman fell to the floor, and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank trembling into a chair as the old woman, with burning eyes, walked to the window and raised the blinds. He sat until he was chilled to the bone, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. The candle end, which had burned low the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls, until with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute afterwards the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke but sat silently listening to the ticking of the clock. The stairs creaked, and a squeaking mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after laying for some time, screwing up his courage, he took a box of matches, striking one, and went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs, the match went out, and he paused to strike another. And at that same moment, a knock came so quiet and stealthily as to be scarcely audible, sounded on the front door. The match fell from his hand and spilt into the passage. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room, closing the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. What was that? cried the old woman starting up. A rat, said the old man in a shaking tone. A rat, it's passing me on the stairs. His wife sat up in bed. A loud knock resounded through the house. It's Herbert! She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, catching her by the arm, holding her tight. What are you going to do? He whispered hoarsely. It's my boy! It's Herbert! She cried out mechanically. I forgot it was two miles away. What are you holding me for? Let me go. I must open the door. For God's sakes, don't let it in, cried the old man, trembling. You're afraid of your own son, she cried, struggling. Let me go. I'm coming, Herbert. I'm coming. There was another knock, 
and another. The old woman, with a sudden wretch, broke free and ran from the room. The husband followed to the landing, and calling after her, appealingly, as she hurried down the stairs, he heard the chain rattle back and the bolt draw slowly and stiffly from its socket. Then the old woman's voice strained and panted. The bolt, she cried out. Come down, I can't reach it. But her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor to search for the paw, if only he could find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect fuselage of knocks reverberated through the house, and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife pulled it down to the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back. At that same moment, he found the paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. The knock ceased suddenly, although the echoings of it were still in the house. He heard the chair drawing back and the door open. A cold wind rushed up the staircase and a loud long wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him the courage to run to her side and then to beyond the gate. The street lights flickered opposite shine in a quiet and deserted street. And that was The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs.